Hi everyone and welcome to Homegrown the Live Show. Today we are talking all about garlic and I'm really excited because we're going to have our first ever guests on the show. So I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction to our guests soon but this is what we've got coming up, up in today's show. We're going to do a little bit of a highlight of the week and our guests are going to share theirs as well. We are going to do plant of the week and then we're going to dive into how to grow garlic, all the tips and tricks for getting the best garlic as well as how to harvest and store it. So I know Gary and Julie, our guests, have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to growing garlic. They grow quite a lot of garlic um, and a lot more than me, that's for sure. So they are going to share lots of their tips and tricks with us, which is very exciting. But make sure you stick around till the end because we're also going to talk about direct sowing seeds and what seeds can we direct sow right now in autumn for the cool season. So they're also going to share what they are going to be sowing directly in the garden. So that is what is happening today. But I did want to give a little bit of an introduction to our guests. They are a couple that I met through Instagram, actually. I don't know how long now. It must have been like four years, four or five years ago. And they ended up coming to my house and dropping off a whole bunch of Monstera cuttings, which are thriving. Um, they are looking amazing. But we sort of just connected really easily and I we clicked straight away. We also share really similar uh, ethics and principles in gardening. They garden with nature. They use a lot of food forest style permaculture techniques in their garden, which is amazing, by the way. If you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen a little bit of a sneak peek at their garden and it is... It is incredible. It's so inspiring. Every time I go there, I just want to go home and get in the garden. So that is a little bit about them. But they are from um, South London and they moved to Australia 17 years ago and they have been gardening here ever since. So they have a lot of knowledge in gardening in Perth and in Australia, which is really different. I think people um, sort of don't understand I guess how different it is gardening here in Perth because we have such hot dry summers it is really hard to garden here in summer especially with our sandy soils and just on that Gaz is the like has a wealth of knowledge in soil building he has given me so many tips in building soil in our garden but just quietly Let's not get him started on soil today because he will be off on a tangent and he just wants to share all his knowledge. And uh, that is something that we are definitely going to get him back on the show for. But today we're talking all about garlic and yeah, that's pretty much it from me. Let's give our guests a warm welcome and I would like to introduce you to Gary and Julie from Bespoke Hive and Down to Earth Life. Hi, Gaz. Hi, Jules. Oh, I've got you on mute. That's my bad. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. They're back. Hello. Try again. <laughs> yeah. Hi. I've got I've got so many little tabs up on my screen, honestly. Right. It's I'm used so to hard. I'm using myself anyway, half the time. Yeah. <laughs> but that you... You both have um, so much knowledge when it comes to growing garlic. So I'm really excited to just jump straight into all the tips and tricks on growing garlic. But first up, let's do a highlight of the week. So let me know what your highlight of the week is um, in the garden or not. Right. Well, here at the moment, um, it's a beautiful time of the year just the beginning of autumn and all the mary flowers and the gum flowers are out on all the trees around where we live in Cardup, which is southeast of Perth, about 40 minutes drive from the centre of Perth. 
Um, so the highlight of the week for me at the moment is the pungent smell of honey in the garden. I wish you could smell it because we're sitting here and all I can smell is honey. So I know that the bees are working hard on the flowers, but I also know that the hives are filling up. We've got 10 hives now. It started off with one and then gradually got to 10. Um, so they're filling up. So probably in about a month's time, we may have some fresh honey from the hives. And that's why Gary's in his suit. Yes, at the moment. and I'm wearing my bee overalls just for you, Gaz. So oh, Gary oh, is a beekeeper and he also um, is an educator with bees and he helps people with their hives in their garden, either get them started or get them being healthy and growing, um, getting some honey. So yeah. we're going to have to talk out, about that Holly. sometime too. Yeah, just watch out, Holly, because Gary might want to borrow those. As well. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We have to we watch out for that. <laughs> Honestly, it's a little bit too hot to be wearing these today. It's like 30-something degrees still. And I'm, um, I know. I know. It's, it's yeah. nice. We're sitting underneath a gum tree at the moment, so we're sitting in the shade. So we're getting a slight breeze. So it's pretty nice at the moment. Mm. Yeah, you have yeah, so much like um, shade in your garden from a lot of it that you've made yourself. I can see in the background there you've created a lot of vertical gardens to sort of overcome that harsh summer weather that we have yeah. and provide a lot more shade for your garden yes um following like a lot of food forest principles if you haven't got the shade and obviously trees do take a little bit of time to grow create your own shade where you can so we've got a lot of these pole structures that you can see behind us in the garden so we grow a lot of um perennial edibles up them to give us shade in the summer and we also put shade cloth over the top um, to create that sense of a food canopy, a uh, forest, forest canopy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's an incredible highlight of the week. I can't say that I can smell honey from my garden. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I do have a bottle gourd. I did share on my last video that I have the, and I don't, I know I'm going to say this wrong, I said this long last week, but the Kakuza, Kaguza. I don't know how you say that, but anyway, I have that, um, and I thought I had two plants, but turns out one of them is actually a New Guinea bottle gourd, I think it's called, uh, so it's yeah. much, like, fatter, like, it's mm -hmm. it's huge. It just was getting bigger and bigger, and I was like, I don't feel like this is the kakuza. I feel like this is something else, so I looked back at the seeds that I had planted, and it was the bottle gourd, um, not mm -hmm. the cool, like, weird shaped one that you've got. You've got, like, the birdhouse one. Yes, yes. I've got the birdhouse, but I've also got the one, the New Guinea bean, the bottle gold. Um, oh, and I, I think that. you, I think you may have picked one of those up from my house a few months ago when I gave you some <laughs> seedlings because I gave you some that didn't have any names on. Um, and there were so I've got those. And what you can, they can go really big, and then you can dry them out and use them like cut them in half and make little containers out of them so it's huge um, it's like yeah. it's so big yeah. but I've got quite a lot on the go like there's a it's a very generous plant like mm. I'm gonna harvest a two big ones but there's so many more on there so that's my highlight of the week I'm very excited that I just kind of like randomly got this plant that I wasn't really expecting I do remember <laughs> planting it but um I I am a bit of a seed fairy in that I just plant things in places really and then I forget yeah that's, that's a, good though that's the diversity you want in the garden like and i love i love forgetting what i've planted and then finding out and going what's that and then surprise so that's nice i yeah i'm i am <laughs> i did that with turmeric the other day i just saw it popping up and i was like oh i must have planted turmeric here but I, i'll mm. take that i love it it's yeah, like yeah. a surprise all the time um mm. and always something new to be planting um but we also have our plant of the week, which you guys have sent me through. So let's just touch on mm -hmm. our plant of the week chosen by you. Yeah, the borage. The borage for me, um, it is my plant of the week because now that the temperatures are slightly cooling, it self-seeds in my garden and it's popping up everywhere at the moment. So it makes me happy and I know what it's doing for the soil. Um, the 
Borage is one of those plants that I think that and comfrey is like one of the two plants you must have in your garden because not only it just gives you lots of lots of things. Um, borage, the flowers are edible. The leaves are actually edible if you pick them young because they, when they get big, they get really spiky and hairy. Mm, but in, in the young now. I'm not very good at pronouncing Italian things um, either. So I'm, I'm, not. Probably, I'm probably going to get Italian shamed again. Um, but in some areas of Italy, they actually call it Baraggio. I think that's the name. And they make, um, they cook the leaves when they're young and mix them with ricotta and use it as a stuffing for um, like ravioli type dishes. And it's like they have little festivals of it to celebrate it. So yeah. it is edible, the whole thing. It gives a massive taproot into the soil. So if you've got poor soil, it's aerating the soil for you. So it's actually working for you while it's giving you produce at the other, other end. It's beneficial to a lot of insects, the bees, hoverflies, loads of insects like it. It's also a sacrifice plant for me in the autumn because the leaves get attacked by caterpillars. So I plant it and let it pop up around my brassicas, my cabbages, my cauliflowers. So I, they don't get attacked so much and the caterpillars are going for the leaves on the borage. It's also with the tap root, when it's going into the soil, it's mining minerals out of the soil into the leaves. So it's a fantastic chop and drop plant that you can mulch your garden with and it will feed your soil. And it's also like the comfrey because it's a similar family. It's a compost accelerator. So if you put the leaves into your compost bin or your worm farm, it actually helps break everything down quicker. And it, it, it feeds nitrogen into the soil and it holds water as well, the leaves, because they are quite, um, like, yeah, they're sort of, when you break cellular. them open, they're very cellular, you know, like they, they very hold a lot of water. So it's just a fantastic plant to have in the garden so that is my plant of the week for everybody um but get yourself it. some borage. if you can't get some borage come to my garden and dig some up because i've got tons <laughs> it just like self seeds everywhere which is great because you can control it chickens love it if you've got chickens chickens love to eat it as well because it's giving them minerals as well it's just um a great plant to have can you make tea out of it you can i think some people make tea i'm a bit of a proper tea girl like I like English tea, tea. milk. Yeah, I've got my mug here. Like I do like my tea. So I've heard you can make teas out of it, but I'm it has. I use it as like an edible flower. You know, I love my edible flowers, yes. and um, I use it a lot. It has a slight cucumber flavor. Just it interesting. Does. Yeah. Mm. It and does. a lot of people ask me about this photo. I've posted this photo a few times, and they're like, "How did you get the tie dye one?" Um, yeah. No idea. I, they just self seed. I've got white. Yeah. yeah, I've got white borage and blue borage in the garden that self seeds and pops up everywhere. An interesting story about you saying that you um, with the cucumber taste. My sister visited me here um, from London a few years ago, and she saw something on Instagram where someone had made um, a tankery gin with cucumbers and put borage flowers in so mm. i had loads of cucumbers growing so we put them all through my juicer i had to go and buy a bottle of gin <laughs> and then stuck and stuck loads of borage flowers in them so me and my sister sat in this very garden drinking borage and cucumber cocktails so oh, there you wow. go i mean it does yeah. sound like a combo i've put it like i've put the flowers in gin but i have never done that extreme um yeah. <laughs> but there must be so many interesting ways that you can use it because you yeah, get I'm so sure you get so many of them. Like, they're very know. abundant producers. It's a super plant for me, and I'm really happy. That's my, but it's the, you've asked me for my plant of the week because I'm sitting here now looking at the garden and I can see it popping up. So I know it's doing good things for the soil yeah. before it produces flowers. And, oh, um, and it gets the bees through the winter. Yes, yes. The bees love it. Yeah, it's a flower in the winter for the bees as well. Do when they, they need to native bees like it like i know that our blue banded bees do yes, like a do. blue flower they do you don't get so many blue banded bees about here in, in the winter, winter. It's too cold for them summer. but they're more of a sort of summer bee for us but there are other um native bees which i'm terrible at knowing about them i know i see them here but i'm i don't know the names yeah. um but there are some really small ones about in the winter that do like it yeah 
Mm, well, that is fantastic, guys. You need to get yourself some borage. I mm. often have it just popping up. Yeah, like I said, mm -hmm. it, it the colors merge, and I end up with random things like this one that looks tie dyed. Um, I do, yeah, it's just that's just a self seeded borage from my garden. Um, but yeah, we do love plants that have multiple uses, and I think that's a really big thing when it comes to permaculture and creating, you know, a really diverse garden is having these plants that have multiple uses in the garden. That yes. way, yeah, you're just getting. Especially if you have a small garden, you're getting a lot more bang for your buck in terms of um, plants that are like feeding our soil as well as us and helping out all our beneficial insects, which then in turn grows us more food because they help with the pollination. So it's a win-win. Yep. We love, you know, plants that have multiple uses. Yes, definitely. So, well, let's jump into the topic of garlic because I know mm. you both grow a lot of garlic um yes. how, much, how much garlic do you grow um we dedicate this is how sad we are really but we, we dedicate um a large bed in our garden which is sort of purpose built for garlic because when we move to this property it's very hard like gravelly soil sandy soil so you need a pickaxe to get through it so what we worked out was we have to go up so near enough all of our beds um, apart from where the trees are and the fruit trees and other things um, are raised um, so we built a purpose bed for the garlic because a lot of our garden is under shade and it's got a lot of the trees so a lot of our vegetable beds are under those and we find that garlic needs winter sun so in here in in Perth it's normally planted any time between March and June. So we plant at the end of April. Um, traditionally, it works for us um, around Anzac Day, which is at the end of April. And yeah. we harvest any time between beginning of October and beginning of November. If there's no set date. They're rough guidelines. Um, yeah. So you're looking at about six months. So what everyone needs to do is to think about how much they want to grow and where's the best place in their garden or pots um or raised beds or planters um got 30 square meters. yeah we have 30 square meters of garlic space, space. and i guess um, it also depends on how much garlic you want to cook with like how many you know do you use a bowl a week do you use a bowl a night do you use exactly. you know one or two a month i guess yeah. it's yeah working out that so then you can sort of figure out how much space you're going to need because the great thing about garlic i need to grab my little bulb that you gave me um <laughs> is that obviously okay. each garlic has many garlic bulbs yeah. seeds on it so <laughs> that how how many is on a bulb well this these, these are ours which we saved from um the harvest we harvested um about the 15th of um mm. Oh, was it October or November? It was earlier year? this year. It was earlier. So the reason why, this is another thing, the reason why we harvested earlier this year was because um, we got a lot of late rain and we didn't want the bulbs to rot because once they start getting really big and you've got this papery layer around them, they yeah. can split open, um, which is okay if you're going to be eating the garlic yourself because you'll be eating it you know, pretty quick. But because we want to save a lot of the garlic for seed garlic for the following season, um, we want the paper intact because that's protecting the cloves inside. Mm. So we made a decision to pull ours a little bit earlier than we would because we didn't want it to sit there in, in wet soil, like too wet. So that's another reason. So I would say to anyone There's watching or listening yes. today, this, these bulbs have got about nine or ten. So each one of those cloves would form. So one of these bulbs here will give you nine bulbs from the seed nine yeah, nine, nine cloves yeah so there's nine individuals so what i'll do is so that's your that's your bulb of garlic so what i'll do is i'll take i'll take a clove off so you can see so that's your clove of garlic so each one of these planted will give you a bulb so what you need to do is prepare if you're using a part of your garden or a bed that has had a summer crop in, you need to refresh your soil. So you need to put down a good sort of 20, 10 centimetre, 10 to 20 centimetre layer of or like compost. So we use our own compost yep. from our compost bays. If you haven't got your own, 
buy in the best you can some you know um compost that's that's mixed some of them are mixed with some like sheep manure or something like that so that's pretty good um never put any really fresh manure in because that no. will burn bulbs so we we just use our own com, uh, compost so we refresh the beds then we plant so we plant our method is a hand width apart so anywhere you sort of see we'll say 10 to 15 centimeters yeah so that is really basically a hand width so we plant each bulb a hand width apart and we use <laughs> it's very digital this with your digits so <laughs> with, you get your finger basically you know up to your knuckle second knuckle that, well, we do, is it yeah well no way definitely. yeah two two knuckles. so you plant you plant that deep so basically you're planting double the okay. depth of the clove yeah so that's quite similar to a lot of our seeds that we're planting right we're, we're planting yes, yes, twice yes. the depth of the seed yes. so it's the same with garlic yeah so you you plant the pointy end up yeah so you know the little bit there with the little point that goes up and yeah so you drop it in your hole see some people get really technical and get get a little dip out they have like little tools that they yep. make but we use our fingers and you don't <laughs> need to take the skin off like it, the no. the protective skin no. that stays on no. straight no. as it is now some people there is people that will um soak soak their garlic overnight in like a sea salt or mm -hmm. you know like um a compost tea or a worm tea solution just to give it like a little bit of activation yeah we don't do we've tried it we've done it once where we did half the bed soaked and half the bed not and it made absolutely no difference but i think it's all up to choice yeah um we might read some guides on the internet that will tell you to do that um some some don't um we don't but that's our choice but you can you won't you won't do any harm if you do soak it overnight um i'm all I think for it's like easy, easy, simple easy get yeah. it done. <laughs> i really think it's um up to your soil as well because we're confident in our soil and we know our soil's True. healthy we don't really feel that we need to sort of boost it yeah um but if you're starting from scratch and you've got a fresh new bed that you've you've put in or you've got a large pot that you want to pot because you can grow garlic in pots Yes. Um, they only need, you know, that a hand width for part. So if yeah. you've got like a sort of large pot, you could easily put four cloves in and get yourself four, you know, four bulbs. The great thing about garlic as well is um, it can be grown practically with any vegetable. So if you've got a very small garden or a small space, now remember we we gardened in England um, before we moved out here, so we did have a smaller space. So we didn't have what we've got now. So quick crops are brilliant to put around your garlic so if you're doing say a little grid of i don't know four by four by four so 16 cloves you can put some um, radish seeds direct in and you can put some lettuce or rocket pak choy any quick growing crops um around your garlic because garlic's going to take about six months so yeah. you can you can plant and that will also help um keep the weeds down because garlic mm. doesn't like any competition so um it doesn't like loads of weeds around it it's, it's to do with like the growth of the bulb you know they like, yeah. don't like really much interference so i wouldn't plant carrots for instance next to your garlic because the depth of the carrot or, when borage. You, or borage for instance because of the tap root <laughs> um because if when you're pulling that out you're gonna help you're gonna disturb the garlic but you but garlic can literally it's it's happy with anything the only thing that well you can still grow it near it but it might inhibit the growth is beans beans don't really like to be near garlic but anything else does so if you've got a say a small space garden or you've got a, a lemon tree or an orange tree in a pot you can plant garlic underneath fruit trees it's an actually a great companion plant yes. it's really good for keeping a lot of bugs away that's so interesting because of... that's something that i really struggle with and i think probably the main reason that i haven't grown a lot of garlic is because i do i do grow quite mixed together and i always had this thought that i had to have a specific garden for mm. garlic like i guess the same that you'd have to have a specific garden for asparagus i have popped yeah. a few bulbs in my garden here and there i always put in a few i pop, just plant one bulb split it up so i get about nine bulbs which is not a, yeah. a lot but yeah i've always just thought for some reason that i needed to have like its own space but uh, mm. the fact that you're saying that we can like mix them in i'm this is like 
music to my ears. I'm going to be planting a lot of garlic yeah. in a lot of places. It's a bit of it's a bit of a game changer for a lot of people when they hear that because um, I think a lot of people have been conditioned over the years about monocrops. So they think, yeah. oh, I've got to have an old. We do have a dedicated bed to garlic because we're a bit of garlic tragics. We love our garlic, <laughs> right? and a lot of people like to get the seed garlic from us. We're not like massive farmers, you know, or anything. No. But we we got we get like what do we get about fifteen kilos. And we well, probably I can work it out if you yeah, want. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we get and we get and and all oh, right, we have some failures. Sometimes we get some that doesn't grow very well. But yeah. that goes. I use a lot. I do use a lot of garlic in my cooking. I like to give garlic as presents. Um, there's nothing yes. nicer at Christmas Thank to you. give someone yeah <laughs> some to give someone like a little flat homemade plate of garlic. So it's a lovely way of growing a present as well. Yeah. Um. So, any. Getting back to the garlic where you plant it, because I can go off on another thing about oh, garlic. Oh yeah, me too. Um, you can you can plant it basically anywhere. So, but what you have to remember in the back of your head is that garlic has got to stay in the ground for about six months. So, you don't want to plant a cauliflower next to it because the cauliflower is going to completely go to dominate about it. half a meter square and dominate it and cover overshadow. It yeah so quick crops around it if you're going to put yes. any crops around it Le- lettuce is perfect um mm-hmm. radish sure. takes six weeks pak choy i love planting rocket because we eat a lot of rocket yeah um also if you've got a front garden that's mainly ornamentals um garlic is great around roses and and other ornamentals because garlic and any onions they actually do repel um, aphids and they can help with thrips and if people's got chili thrips on their roses and things like that um if you want an alternative i mean i know it's not going to cure them but it will help yeah. um having garlic and onions so you can actually put some garlic around the base of your ornamental plants um fruit trees is brilliant yeah so put garlic everywhere I'm... and in pots and in pots yeah and then yeah. what a lovely to give someone yeah. um you know put a few little put a few little cloves in a little pot put a ribbon around it and give it to someone for a present yeah. you know it's, it's it's a growing present and it's something and feeding i'll go, go to feeding now yep. garlic, otherwise i forget um when you've planted it and you've you've covered up you've put your finger in or your little dibber and you've dropped your clove in and you've covered it up with soil give it a water mm-hmm don't over water so it's waterlogged because that will rot the bulbs so again use your finger um i keep saying to people use your finger it's your best garden tool so every week stick your finger in the soil and if your finger comes out with soil on it doesn't need watering if it comes out dry you need to water that is a huge trick especially (laughs) here in perth (laughs) I do it on everything. I'm just, I, that's why my fingers, look, I'm never going to be like a finger model. On, <laughs> that's got, how we tell. That's, how, that's the telltale sign, that, you know, quality garden over here. Yeah, I got, think that that down. is something that's super important if you are growing here in Perth. I, pe- people ask me all the time about tips for growing in Perth, and the fact is that it is a trick. It's a, it's a trick that you water your garden and you think that it's watered, but you just – slightly move the soil off the surface it's dry it's yeah. like sandy soil tends to the water just disappears i don't know where it goes but it is like just disappears through the sand out gone so that's one really important that we need to be adding compost to our gardens but also yeah. test it out with your finger and see if it's actually <laughs> moist under there i know some people don't love the word moist but i'm all for yeah, the word just moist. <laughs> just, I do. I'm, I'm always walking around going, oh, that needs a water, that doesn't. Because you can be actually two kinds of plants, and especially garlic. Garlic doesn't like a wet bottom, so you put it in free-draining soil. So, And also winter sun. So getting to feeding, we feed every fortnight mm-hmm. with some worm castings tea from our worm farm or if we haven't got enough worm castings at the time because we're using it around the garden as well we'll make a compost tea um it's a bit different yeah it's and then different. it's slightly different but we we do feed they're heavy feeders they're heavy feeders so you need so to keep in them you would do that after like so from the first two weeks so you planted it in yeah. the garden would you do it at week two yeah yep. Yeah, or would you we wait? just do it every 
no we just do yeah. it every fortnight just yeah. to give because when you've got to remember when we start when we're hopefully when we do get the autumn and winter rains um a lot of the food that you're putting on your garden gets washed away as well so yeah. you must keep that food going into these plants um what we also do as well is normally around september we stop feeding mm -hmm. So about a month to six weeks before um, harvesting, we do stop feeding yep. because we want to encourage the the bulb growth. So like these. So mm -hmm. and again, we so the goodness. So imagine this is all green. We you can actually if you get if you if you're craving home garlic, you can actually eat some of the leaves like the and the scapes as they call them, or even the tips. You can just cut them off with scissors. It's not going to harm. But the garlic bulb will draw the goodness down from all the green and like all the all the nutrients that are in the yep. green leaves, and then it starts plumping up the bulbs. So, okay. and then we hold off feeding and we hold off watering, don't we? um because we just want the garlic to grow and grow and grow and take everything out of the leaves into the bulb and then when the leaves start dying off um finger in. we then again use her finger <laughs> and we feel around because you can actually you know just put your finger down and feel around the bulb and when you know it's starting swollen. to bulb up and it's getting really swollen you you, you take you a view on it we do, we we pull one out and go that looks all right and then start yeah, pulling the and then hang it up let it dry and let it dry um and then after about a week if you're going to do any platting we plat then because when you if you plat it when it's too green it can snap and when you plat it when it's too brown it, it breaks. can breaks as well so we i let it go for about a week and then any plats i do i do then yeah and then i let, we just leave them hanging and when they're completely dried out that's when we trim the bottom roots off with a pair of scissors and i got an old paintbrush and i brush the dirt off you never peel them um when you and we do, don't wash you, them no 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 because you don't want any this is if you wanted to wash one to use it that week then yeah. that's fine but, but for if storage you, long term storage storing problem you never you wash them now, because though. look yeah you can see here i don't know they've still got a little bit of dirt on them and why um, do you wait to cut the roots off the bottom is there a, because you want I just want everything to dry out because if you're doing everything too wet, you, sometimes you can actually cut it and you can score the bottom of the bulbs. Yeah, and then you know they can get diseased and. So it's like similar to a pumpkin in that you want to be really yes. careful and allow yes. them to fully harden before you're yes. doing anything. You want them to dry naturally, air dry, in yeah. not in direct sunlight. What did you want to say? Um, just don't. Try not to put any manures on your bed other than, say, sheep poo. Because sheep Too poo much nitrogen. Right. Yeah, and sheep poo's got a relatively balanced levels of the NPK, you know, nitrogen, the potassium, yep. and the phosphorus, right? And garlic. Garlic aren't really that hungry for nitrogen. And the trouble is if you start using the liquid feeders on them, you're going to put too much nitrogen in them. So you're going to get a lot of green growth and not a lot of that part, yeah. what I call the fruit. So I like to use worm casting tea or compost tea. And I like to use sheep poo if I'm going to add manure to the bed. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important because it, it, yeah, high nitrogen soils produce a lot of leafy greens. And with garlic, we want the root. So... Yeah. There's that's a, a tip for you and he yeah. did very well at containing himself there because i know he would love to talk more about soil yeah. <laughs> i've been squeezing his knees <laughs> honestly i love it i mean he has like has so much knowledge when it comes to soil um and we're definitely going to have to do a compost i think we're gonna have to do a compost tea one gas because uh that is something or even worm tea or the teas we'll do a tea one tea yes, sip and tea it's great to use what you've got in your garden. You can do a wheat yeah. tea, you can do any sort of tea. But then you're not buying, you know, the less inputs you bring into your garden, the better, you know, yeah. in the long run. Um, but we all started somewhere. And we made we made lots of mistakes. Our first time going gro growing garlic here, I got a load of fresh horse poo yeah. and put it in bed. And then I just had like a bed of grass. 
and I couldn't tell what, I couldn't tell what the garlic was um, until the garlic got bigger. And then back that by that time, the grass had seeded, and it was a nightmare, wasn't it? So, yep. oh my yeah. gosh, I love that. <laughs> So that's why we don't like using horse manure in garlic beds or no. a lot of beds. We actually do like horse manure, we'll put it through the compost. but we put it through our compost system to, you know, get the hot composting going to burn any seeds that might be in it because there's yeah. nothing worse than getting your garlic garden or any beds prepped and then looking at it three months later and it's full of grass. <laughs> but we've been there. We've been there and we've done it. So, yeah, we've learned from it. Yeah. Oh, but these like these mistakes. I mean, I love cele- I honestly I love celebrating um failures mm. and mistakes in the garden because I feel like that's where you really learn the most because you probably researched it or looked into it further and it's also embedded in your mind because you're like I don't want to do this again. So <laughs> that's something that I'm so passionate about. It's like sh- celebrate your failures. Celebrate yeah, them okay. because it means that you're learning, you're embedding knowledge and you're just going to become a better gardener for it don't shy away from it and think oh gosh i'm not telling anyone i just you know grow a whole lot of grass um uh, i've done it loads of times don't worry about it and i've also planted seeds and then pulled them out because i thought they were weeds so (laughs) and i still do that do you know what i mean i still do that so um yeah i do that quite often (laughs) it's all part of it it's part of the journey there is it there is the good thing about these things is that we keep these from november to around about now and we put them in the ground and if we've got any left and they start to sprout julie just sticks them in the freezer and we eat them yeah let's talk about how how we store them because you just mentioned that you wait a week um was it a week and if you're going to plait them, so you wait a week yeah. and then you plait them and then you cut off the roots. And then what yes. do you do with them? We hang them. Um, we hang them indoors. We hang them plank. indoors and then I complain because the whole house stinks of garlic. Um, <laughs> no, no vampires though. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's, no vampires, but after a while it's like, uh-huh. um, But, yeah, so we... We we've we hang we hang them actually in our carpool because it's enclosed um, and then we move them to a shed um, and then I, I hang them in bunches of ten just because I like that and it's easier for me to know how many yep. I've got. Um, we do have a couple of people who like to buy them buy some off of us not long after we've harvested and dried them. Yeah, and I do like to give them as Christmas presents. And um, a lot of my family get garlic in England. It gets sent over. Um, you send, send it to England? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Steve's yeah. growing some. Yeah. Gary's brother in Christchurch, not the New Zealand one, but the one. Oh, in I was going to say, I'm surely you can't yeah. send it to New Zealand. New Zealand would have a very <laughs> um, He actually, we, he's, he's been growing it now for a couple of years from our garlic that we wow. sent him. In his allotment in um oh. in the, it but it's obviously they're growing it in this well no they're, actually they're planting it they plant it before christmas there's don't two they? type sure. there's two plantings in europe right yeah. you can either go in the autumn and, it, autumn. and it grows mm. yeah let me get back in camera and it grows for about <laughs> that long or you can go into spring mm. now what was really interesting is that i saw a picture the other day because england had some really bad weather in march and there was a garlic bed with the the garlic must have been about, I don't know, 100 mil high. Yeah. It had been planted in the autumn. And there was three inches of snow, 75 mil of snow. Mm. Now, I sent I sent him a message and went, oh, I've just seen a picture of some, you know, UK garlic. Cause it was it ours from Australia, which would originally come from Italy? <laughs> he went to me, no, it's not my bed. But he goes, garlic can, can survive down to 31, minus 31 degrees centigrade. Mm. Yeah, I did read somewhere that frosts help them bulb up and that if they don't get the frost and they don't get the bulbs. But I was like, interested in that because that's we don't get frost. I don't know about you. I mean, you are about 45, 40, 40 minutes away from me, but I certainly don't get frosts. But you've got also got to remember, Holly, this is soft-necked garlic. It's Italian purple and it's just or it's a soft neck or hot word oh, maybe it's soft neck okay. it's one of them is that like the hard neck varieties likes the likes the colder i think 
Yeah, um, we'll research that because I may be completely wrong. But one of them, <laughs> don't say that. One of them, one of them is yeah. One of them is good in the cold, better. That's why yeah. some of the garlic that's grown in the eastern states and Tasmania, um, you can't get here anyway because no, you, you can't get it sent over. But it's um, a slightly different cultivar to the stuff that we grow here. The stuff we grow here is mainly Italian. That's they say it's Italian pink and purple. And the elephant garlic, which is basically a giant leek, um, the it's originally come from Italy, but then it's been grown here for so long, so yeah. it's actually acclimatized to the yeah. WA climate. But it's interesting that it grew really well in the UK. Yeah, because that's something like I guess with all of our seeds and like as as it, as locally as you can get them, because they are acclimatized to our climates, and that yeah. is going to make them grow a whole lot easier than yeah importing yes. them from. Yeah, that, that, um, that seed it comes with not only is its own dna but it also comes with its own microbes mm. that actually help it um germinate yeah. yeah so as we as we plant seeds and we keep taking the seeds from those plants right they start to develop their own unique microbial makeup that supports their their germination mm. in the soils that we work in yeah now you've got absolutely awful soil yeah. You know, I do. Miracle, I am basically in a sand pit. <laughs> it's a miracle that we can actually grow anything at all. Yeah. But that's another story. Yeah. But storing think, garlic. But, yeah, storing garlic. Um, I've never done the whole garlic in oil or garlic in honey, which I know people do preserve in. I did do the garlic okay. and the honey. I did like that. Just did no. one little one. Yeah. I. I bought myself a better dehydrator this year. So I am going to be, after we've done our planting, if we've got any left over, I am going to de dehydrate some because I really yeah. want to um, sit it up and make some garlic powder. Yeah. So I think that would be really nice. Um, but other than that, I freeze my garlic um, whole in the paper. Like just, I just break open the cloves. Mm -hmm. I put them in little zip Ziploc bags. And then all throughout the year until I'm harvesting again, I take them out and I just grate them into dishes. Um, and the paper just comes off really easy as it's because they're sort of defrosting as you're grating. But grating frozen garlic is great as well because it's not so messy. So um, I do that and it keeps its flavour yeah. and it doesn't go off. So I freeze little Ziploc bags in my freezer so that I've got, I've, I haven't bought any garlic for six years. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. You're fully self-sufficient in garlic. And but you're more than self-sufficient in garlic because you, <laughs> you give so much away and like yeah. that's incredible. But it's um only since we've moved here and we've got the space, obviously yeah. before that, um I grew as much as I could. Yeah. Um but my tip for anyone listening is when you get source as much garlic as you can as local to you can. So try and get um organic garlic from the shop a lot of shops now sell organic garlic and ask for the provenance where it's grown it sh they will tell you go to your local farmer's market yeah. and buy it um or if there's a local garlic farm because i know oh. some areas try it please don't buy any imported garlic so in i know there might be a few people um listening from england there's some beautiful garlic farms in England. There's some beautiful garlic farms in Australia. Um, there's no need to buy imported garlic. Chinese garlic and Mexican garlic, which is the two biggest, and Indian garlic, which is the, well, China and Mexico are the biggest ones for um, coming into Australia. It's sprayed um, before it's imported so that it doesn't, one, go mouldy, and two, bring any pathogens into yeah. the country. So you're killing everything. And the Chinese garlic is also bleached so to make it lovely and white because mm. garlic is not that white. Yeah. So as you know, because if you break open a garlic, it's got that creamy texture, like yeah. a creamy colour. So... Think about if you really, really want to, you know, know what you're putting in your mouth or your dinner or your children's dinner. Yeah. Don't buy imported garlic because it will be sprayed um, and it it will, yeah, it will have all the goodness taken out of it anyway. And you're only putting that into your soil. Yeah. So source your garlic um, locally, and the local, the more local to where you live, the better, as Gary said, because the DNA it's and it'll be acclimatized as well. Yeah, um, and I mean, like the the more that we can do in terms of getting local and growing local means that yeah, like you guys are 
growing local garlic and then you're also gifting it and letting other people grow the garlic it's, it's yeah. i love that chain reaction and that's helping yeah. so many people yeah. i mean it gro- the, the great thing about growing local is also that it grows so much easier like if it is acclimatized to our conditions and some of us live in really like harsh conditions here in perth we have very hot dry we have a we have like a very specific type of growing, but then I guess overseas or over over east, they have their own very specific type of, you know, maybe they have a lot of humidity. And so yes. if you can source plants that grow really well with that humidity, then it's going to make it so much easier for you to grow. You don't have to put, you don't have to care for it as much. You don't have to baby it as much because it's going to be more, you know, used to growing in that condition. So as, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. as local as you can really. And if everyone can start their own sort of like chain reaction, as you said, with the seed saving, seed banking, then um, I'm all for that. I'm really all for that because, um, you know, it means you you want to buy seeds and you want to swap seeds and you want to grow seeds because everyone is doing this because they want to, you know, want to grow their own food. And it's just the pleasure of being in the garden. Mm. Um, You know, for me, it's a massive thing for me to spend a little bit of time in the garden every day. Um, I could have had the worst day ever and then um, just going out in the garden for half an hour. So even just planting a couple of things, knowing you've grown it yourself, saving that seed and watching the whole thing go around in circles again, you know, it's just lovely. I I get really excited of a seed germinating, you know, whatever it is. And then obviously, you know, I've pulled half of them out because I thought they might be weeds. But um, it's one of the best things ever. That's why, you know, we, we love it. Yeah. Yeah. I know I it's yeah it is such a rewarding journey and to to be able to be involved in that whole process from garden to table and then back to garden again I think that is our ultimate goal is to be able to complete like complete complete that loop and um, not only complete the loop but also start other loops in terms of gifting seeds and you just have no idea I think even just gifting you know your homegrown garlic by itself can inspire people to grow their own in some capacity. I think that's a huge thing is even if all you're doing is creating a spark, creating a little bit of inspiration to other people. Um, I don't know about you, but like my fate, it's one of my favorite feelings is feeling inspired and that real like excited feeling. And you just want to get out into the garden. And that's a feeling that I get every time I come to your house, every time I come to your garden, I have that feeling. I just think, Oh my gosh, like, I just can't wait to plant some more things in the garden. Um, this is, well, hang on, this is like Julia's coriander. You know, we bought, we got a plant, I don't know, six years ago, and she just collects the seeds of the coriander plant every yeah. year. She's growing potpourri, everyone. Yeah. Everyone at home, she's growing potpourri. Yeah, <laughs> I, right. I'm not a coriander eater. <laughs> no, you need a, you always got to have a good curry. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, my tip of the another tip of the week is grow coriander from seed. <laughs> no, yeah. no, yeah. I can't do it. It tastes like Nana's pot so- curry. <laughs> 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 but you eat. People say it's part of your DNA. Like, are you for coriander or are you against coriander? It's such a big oh, debate. Nice. Um, oh, it's fascinating, really. I get people, I get people when we do the market stalls and they come past and like some like. The wife would pick up a packet of coriander seeds or something, and then the husband would go, "Oh no, it's like soap, <laughs> like eating soap." And I always think there's always like a yin and a yang, you know, like there's like yeah. one person who loves it and the other person who really hates it. There's no in between. No, no it's in- very there's much different about mine, it. Mine is extreme. Eggplant. Yeah, Gary's is eggplant. eggplants. He can't stand them. Ah. They've got a lot of nicotine in them. And I grow them. Yeah, because just- I've seen a lot. You grow a lot of eggplants. Yeah, because Gary don't like him. Oh. <laughs> I don't. Mine is like my hard no is mushrooms. Like it's a hard no from me. Absolutely not. My son's the same. My son hates mushrooms. Nope. I think it's because I might have told him they were slugs when he was little. You told me that. Oh, that's I'm so sure. mean. I'm not sure, but Lewis, sorry. I know he doesn't like mushrooms. It's Even a very... Now. It is a very um, yeah. good it's description of them. 
Disgusting. Even now, Lewis, when he comes over from, he lives in Beechworth in Victoria. And when he comes over, if I'm making like lasagna or something, and he, he comes out and he's like, he stirs it and he looks and he goes, is that mushrooms in there? And I'm like, no. And then like, they are. But I've chopped them up so small. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, uh, you Jackie, can't fool Jackie, me either. Oh, no. <laughs> on the comments, Jackie K, definitely not a fan of coriander. Oh, um, no. Nah. She's, she's on to a winner <laughs> here. Thanks, Jackie. She's in my <laughs> corner. <laughs> I, I actually do like it, but, um, I, yeah, but if anyone's going to grow it, grow it from seed. Because you can, I mean, plants are fine, but growing it from seeds really cool okay so on that let's jump into a few q and a's because we've we've basically gone over like where you should plant garlic you can plant garlic in pots and containers um you can plant garlic around your fruit trees you can plant garlic around your roses you can plant garlic anywhere by the sounds of it but just you don't want it overcrowded overshadowed so that it it needs space Mm -hmm. to have its own light um and you can interplant it with some really quick growing crops some lettuce some radish um is there anything is there a point in time when you would stop planting things in between it like would that be for the first half say say for the first three months and then the the second three months we kind of just like leave it yeah i think for the first few months that's why the quick crops are really good um you can plant a lot of things around it and then then just weed it you can pull them out and and cut yeah um, but yeah if you've got it if you've got it growing say down one side of the garden and you've got like um i don't know other stuff near it as long as you're not there there's stuff that you can leave in as a long time as well yeah but you don't want to disturb it when disturbed. it's holding up yeah yeah there was one yeah. other thing that you did mention that was um about the mulch is there a specific type of mulch that you use um or not we we actually use lupin mulch. Um, yeah. The reason why we use that is um, it's very like a fine mulch. It disintegrates over the lifespan of the gr- growing the garlic season. So in six months, it's actually gone into the soil because it breaks down. Yeah. And feeds it the soil. And, and when it's damp, it doesn't blow away. That's our reason. Yeah. I know some people that use pea straw in their gardens fine because, again, that's breaking down and feeding the soil as well with nitrogen. Um, but we don't use it here because we're on quite an open area um, and we get these really strong easterly winds. We did use pea straw once and then the next <laughs> morning it was in the next door neighbor's garden. It just blew off. Right. <laughs> I, use, I use pea straw, guys, and um, I've lost half my mulch. <laughs> Yeah, so pea straw is fantastic, absolutely a fantastic, cheaper mulch. And you can Um, get it in bales. That is like one of the main reasons I got it because I I needed – and it's fine in my raised garden beds because they all have sides on them. It's just the open garden beds that have no sides on them. And it's not lost. My neighbours – I don't think my neighbours have my mulch. Um, It's just like moved – it just like – moved all into one corner <laughs> yeah we find the mulch in the corner of the garden so we use we personally use lupin mulch because um i know sugarcane mulch yeah, is fantastic but over east. Um, it's not it's not as a, a readily available in wa as it yeah. is over east and there is another mulch here that you can get bad called triple c which is um canola chicken yeah, and something that. but it brings gary out in the itch, itchy rash and i think it's the canola that does that okay. it's um, not chicken, ideal then say was it chicken corn corn no it's corn chicken and canola i think it's made yeah. from yeah. but that's another good one but mm. we can't we don't use it because it makes gary itchy. <laughs> <laughs> no poor gears <laughs> have an itchy oh. and <laughs> before we forget before we jump into the questions because we do have a few questions yeah, in here that i want to answer but before we do that i have promised that we are going to talk about direct sowing seeds and what are you direct sowing right now in the garden um okay. so let's just quickly jump into that now and yep. um these are some of the things that you are direct sowing and also i am direct sowing in the garden right now for cool season planting yes. um Rockets on there. You said that was your favourite. I mean, we're still a little bit warm here. So um, I haven't, 
I, I never direct so brassicas anyway. I always, yeah. I, they're growing. They're in my shade yeah. house. They're in punnets and everything. Um, but for direct sowing in the soil now, oh, well radish. They're on the swing gal. Oh, okay, cool. Radish, rocket. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to squint now. Glasses on, right? <laughs> I'm going to have to draw my head. Right. For those that are listening as a podcast, we do have um, slides up for our live video. So it is great because it does prompt us. But if you ever want to yeah. go back and watch the video, it is available on YouTube. And also if you are on Spotify, the video is available as well. But yeah, direct well, Mark, sewing is my favorite Mark, thing. Yeah, March in WA and in other parts of Australia as well is a traditional time for peas and snow peas and sweet yeah. peas, even the flowers. People say you should get them in around um, St. Patrick's Day, which is coming up this weekend. Um, but I, I I, like to stagger my planting as well. So I I have actually put in a few peas and yeah. I've put a few broad beans in. But broad beans here can be planted right up till um may so i don't plant everything all in one go i like to stagger yep. um so that i've got a continuation so i have planted some daikon radish because i do like that yeah and i like it roasted um i've planted rocket i love rocket yeah. rocket is one of my favorite um peppery i plant a lot of rocket beans. yeah and um it's really good around beans i plant yeah you know, i love these quick crops because yeah. you know you're trying to use up as much space as you can so while you're waiting say for something to grow like my cauliflowers which will be going in in the next couple of weeks because they're you know their punnets are ready um i will plant quick crops around them so my direct sow tips are rocket salad greens radish and then your beans and your peas they're the things you should be direct sowing um plant them the direct the depth of the seed yeah and my other tip for everyone is when you do put them in just make sure that they do come in contact with the soil so like the rocket seeds are tiny so when you sprinkle them press them down with your hand so mm -hmm. that they're in direct contact with the soil if you just sprinkle them and leave them like loosely on top of the soil and then sprinkle some soil on top you can get an air pocket and then when you're watering and it, you're going to get these damp um nights and you get the dewy morning so you're going to get a lot of um damp soil yes when you get a lot of mildew and mold on your seeds because they you know when they're germinating um they've got that air pocket around them so always i i always find i get best results when i press the press the seed directly onto the soil then put a bit of soil on top yeah and not too deep i think as well no, i mean um, like not too no. shallow not too deep no not too just down I <laughs> like i no. mean there are a lot of the, things to the, it but the depth of the seed is always um, uh, for me. Yeah. So I will literally um, brush the soil with my hand just to break it up, yeah. sprinkle the lettuce seeds, and then I will I will sprinkle a tiny bit of the soil over the top. It doesn't yeah. matter if some of the seeds are on show um, because they it's a quick crop. They germinate really quick. Um, they like the cooler weather. So it's the cooler nights are coming now. Like this morning, we had dew on the car for the first time. So we know the cooler nights are coming. Um, so peas and beans, just, die, you know, you've got to do that. They're, they're quite big seeds. So you, yeah. you just pop them in and just cover them. Um, because seeds use so much energy to break through the soil, if you plant them too deep, they use so much energy to come up that that's when they get attacked by the slaters and the slugs and that because it's a little weak seedling. Yeah, the they run out of steam. To come out. Yeah, so it's like come out, it's all weak, and then it's like all the slugs and the you know slaters and the wood lice or whatever you want to call them go, oh, oh that's fair. Go don't even get me started on the slaters or the wood lice. Yeah. That yeah. is a topic yeah. for another day because those are my nemesis in the garden. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you need to make it as hard as possible for these things. So you want a really strong plant, do you know what yeah. I mean, coming up. So, yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the only seed that you don't plant, the depth of the seed, to be honest with you, carrots. We just put straight on top of the soil. Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't want to bury put, those carrots. And I put a piece of timber on top of it until they germinate. Timber? It, yeah, mm. a piece of, little piece of bald, right? that stops, lets it germinate, but stops the soil drying out. Yeah. For a week, I'll leave it on for a week, so a little slat of timber on top of my carrots. So the only plant that you can plant deeper than the depth of its, the seed itself is sweet corn. Mm -hmm. You know, sweet corn seeds about that yeah. big, 
and you can actually plant it about that big. Oh, that so so sweet corn must have more juice to like get to the surface. Probably. Probably because it's don't genetically know, because modified. Because it's genetically modified. <laughs> yeah, and I mean that's cool. a topic for another day too. <laughs> <laughs> and we are, we are, we because something that I don't think I mentioned earlier was that um, Gary and Julie also sell seeds um, on their website, and I have got a link to that in the description. So. Make sure you check that out. They are partnered with Seed Freaks that grow seeds uh, from Tasmania, which a lot of people will probably think, you know, why are we growing seeds from Tasmania? But um, this is definitely a topic for another day. But the main thing is, is that they are growing in Australia. And although you might be thinking that most of the seeds that you're purchasing are grown in Australia, they are in fact not, um, and it's actually something that we are both really passionate about. So we are going to be doing another episode on that because um, it's something that is really, I guess, hidden. It's something that is, um, yeah, it's it's a yeah. hidden thing that mm. people just don't know about and are being like sold things that they aren't necessarily knowing what they're getting. So we are definitely going to dive into seeds. That's another episode. At some point. Yeah. So make sure you are subscribed. And that is a topic that you do not want to miss because, um, yeah. yeah we're, we're hoping better... to get the um, owners of Sea Freaks on as well. Yeah, and yeah. they've got so much information oh, and wow. so much knowledge. We are going to be talking seeds. all about seeds. But yeah. if you do have any questions, make sure you pop them in the chat because we're going to jump in and just answer a few questions now because I know there was a few that popped up. Um, and let's take a look what we've got. Um, I love it when I see some familiar names in the chat. So we've got Linda, we've got Joe, um, we've got Vanessa from New South Wales. And we do have a question on, um, I think this, this is on um, manure gas. This one is for you. So okay. um, can we put chicken poo in the garlic bed or is chicken poo not um, so great? Right. right. Really sure. simple. Raw chicken, raw. Fresh. Fresh. Raw, All raw manure. Raw, raw, raw manures, right? Mm. Really shouldn't put it straight in your bed. Um, what you should do with the ones that are high in nitrogen, which are called hot manures, which is chicken, rabbit, horse, pig no yeah. cows not right those four <laughs> you really should put through your compost system yeah nitrogen levels in all those fresh manures is really really high yeah and my suggestion is you put them through your compost system or you right? buy aged or you buy aged, aged. Right? Aged. so okay. it's already had time to compost right. down it's not right. so raw and like harsh yeah if you want to put a manure straight from you know the animal that comes in a bag like sheep that's okay because it's been through and cow it's been through their system a few more times yep. so the nitrogen potassium and phosphorus is balanced yep. so my rule of thumb is if it's hot it goes in the compost base if it's cold which is cow and sheep mm. it can go straight in the bed mm. okay if anyone listening doesn't have access to yeah. um, their own compost base or to fresh manure, um, the aged manures that you buy yeah. are okay. And also the pelletized, a lot of people use the, the, the pelletized um, chicken manure, like rooster boosters, yeah. or, and you can actually get some organic ones now. So those are okay. So you can put them in your your beds but obviously Just be a bit careful be careful with the instructions as well so if it's a if it's like a handful per square meter make sure or do half don't it's best to go under than over because um a lot of fresh roots on a lot of seedlings for instance mm -hmm. will burn if yeah they're, if they're too hot um garlic if in your preparation for garlic if you're preparing it a couple of weeks before and you put a handful of um the pelletized chicken manure in that's fine because by the time you've watered it in and a couple of weeks later yeah. it, it you know yeah. it's already breaking down yeah. yeah but just be just be a bit careful and with don't, raw, with, raw. With especially raw manures if you if you get access to those yeah. so, so composting yeah. it is best and in a lot of those um if 
um, if you are getting at stuff from outside of your house as well, it's also good to run that through a hot compost so that you're killing off any of those seeds and random things yep. because you don't really yep. know what you're getting when you are bringing stuff in from outside of your um, right. property as well. So, yeah, compost is king. So that is something we can talk about because it is the heart time. and soul of our gardens, really, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it, Gaz? Yeah, soil is the key to the whole garden. Barry it calls is. it the engine room. It's the, the engine com- room. The compost bay is the engine room of the garden. You grow, I grow is. soil. Judy does all growing all the green stuff. No. Well, um, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sure you've given so many tips for people because we are going to be planting garlic very soon. When did you say you were planting your garlic? It is... We're doing our Anzac Day. So Anzac Day. Depends. Which... Yes, will be slightly different depending on where you are in the world, where you are in the country. Everyone has, um, you know, different climates and we have different um, times to be planting things. But that is uh, what Gary and Julie are planting here in WA in Perth, Australia. And um, two knuckles deep, (laughs) pointy bit up. Um, up. What else are we saying? And width apart. Hand width apart, yeah. mulch, no weeds, plant some quick growing crops to really maximize your space yeah. and maximize the amount of food you can grow in a space for the first three months of the growth. Um, and then Use as the, the leaves start to die off. It's all about the finger. Check the moisture with your finger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining. It's been um, such a great chat on garlic because it is something that I have – not growing a huge amounts of it's something that i grow you know sporadically randomly through the garden um so thank you for sharing your knowledge and you're definitely going to be back because we've got so much more to to discuss we've got seeds to discuss we've got compost teas to discuss there's (laughs) so much happening i'm very excited so uh, make sure you subscribe make sure you are following uh, along so that you can get notifications when a new episode goes live and make sure you check out Gary and Julie's social media pages. I have put links to their Instagram um, and their website in the description. So check that out. You'll be able to see some more photos. They also are at markets. So you'll be able to catch them if you are in Perth, if you are local. They do um, go to quite a few different markets and sell seeds and sell seedlings because Which Julie is the queen them? of seed babies. <laughs> <laughs> she is the queen Tama could not miss an opportunity to, to jump in he's um, oh. got to make his entry he nearly got away with it for the whole show but he's he's here um, thank you for coming that's us. my dog it's yeah. fun yes it is fun so thank you guys and thank you to all of you that have um, shown up in the live and that are listening as the podcast the more that we um, can come and offer you how to grow food how to you know get stuck into the garden it really does make us happy we are um we thrive off that don't we so um thank you all and uh we'll see you in next week's episode live at five on wednesday Bye. bye bye